Good morning, everyone, and welcome virtually to the University of Calgary. My name is Dr. Lorelai Knoll. I'm a proud alumni and assistant professor here in the Faculty of Nursing. I'm honored to be the chair of the Leader in All of Us Conference, and I'm excited you've decided to join us today. I know how busy a time it is for everyone, and I'm hopeful you'll gain much from our panelists and keynote speakers. I'm thrilled to see that we have attendees from all across Canada, as well as internationally from Argentina, Iran, Mexico, Turkey, the UK, and the US. We have alumni, community members, faculty members, students, and we extend our warmest welcome wherever you're joining us today. Investing in young nurses is essential for improving health and healthcare globally. 2020 was declared by the World Health Organization as the year of the nurse and midwife, and the Nightingale Challenge offers us an opportunity to be part of a global movement to empower the next generation of leaders, practitioners, and advocates in health. Today, during the Leader in All of Us conference, we will explore the concepts of leadership and how nurses can leverage their leadership skills to influence nursing practice. I want to thank the organizing committee for all of their support and guidance in bringing this conference to fruition. Without their hard work, today would not have been possible. Nursing has been called one of the most highly trusted professions by some, while others may call it the least trusted based on their experiences. I encourage you all to critically reflect today on where we come from, where we would like to go as individuals, as a nursing profession, and as leaders in healthcare. Registered nurses are advocates for health equity for all particularly for vulnerable and or diverse clients and populations. As a conference committee, faculty and university, we believe equity, diversity and inclusion is about creating a culture that embraces the uniqueness of individuals and is representative of the populations nurses both serve and lead. During this conference and in your leadership practice, I encourage you to explore the diversity of conditions, expressions and experiences present in today's nursing environments while drawing upon the unique qualities and characteristics that each nursing leader holds. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising Siksika, Pakani, and the Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chikini, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I would also like to note that the University of Calgary is situated on land adjacent to where the Bow River meets the Elbow River and that the traditional Blackfoot name of this place is Mokinsis, which we now call the City of Calgary. Now before we get started, there's a few housekeeping issues that I would like to address. Um, I know that we have been on Zoom for a number of months now and it, uh, engaging virtually, but just as a reminder, we kindly ask that all attendees remain muted during the conference and we ask you to please keep your cameras off. During the conference, we encourage you to use the chat function to ask questions and share your ideas, but please be respectful. If you'd like to chat privately with someone, please directly message them on the chat function. The moderators will happily ask your questions for the keynote and panelists during the question and answer periods following their presentations. We invite and encourage you to engage in social media throughout the conference. The hashtag for the conference is hashtag the leader in all of us. We wanna hear about your key takeaways and feel free to tag you Calgary Nursing as well as the speakers who will be sharing their leadership insights throughout the day. We are really delighted that a Vancouver company, Vessi Shoes is our engagement sponsor today. Many nurses at the conference will be aware of Vessi and what they offer in terms of versatility and comfort. Please watch the slides during our breaks for more information or visit Vessi.com. Thanks also to our Karna and our Calgary West Regional Councillors who made the Vessi sponsorship possible. We've scheduled 10 minute breaks between each panel as well as a one hour lunch. Please remember to get up and stretch and take a break during these times. We will do our absolute best to start and end our panels on time. We kindly ask everyone to be respectful of our timelines. Now, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Sean Chilton, Vice President of People, Health, Professions and Information Technology. Sean is a visionary leader with excellent interpersonal communication skills. He's created sustainable, positive working relationships with diverse stakeholders inside and outside the health sector and is a well-respected leader in Alberta Health Services. Sean graduated from Royal Oldham School of Nursing as a registered nurse. He was working as an ICU nurse when he responded to a recruitment ad in Alberta in the early 1990s. Within six months, he was in Grand Prairie working emergency and day surgery at the Queenie II Hospital. 
In the 21 years he was based in Grand Prairie, Sean worked as a nurse, program leader, regional manager, director, corporate business officer, and vice president before moving to Edmonton for a short period of time as the senior vice president for regional hospitals. His clinical and corporate leadership experiences cover a variety of areas in rural and urban settings, including clinical operations, medical affairs, quality improvement of patient safety, privacy, emergency response, primary care, and public health programs. For the last five years, Sean served as Chief Zone Officer for South Zone, and during that time sought to create energetic team and re-engage and re-establish positive working relationships with communities, including the local Indigenous populations. It's my absolute pleasure to welcome Sean Chilton. Sean, I'm going to pass the Zoom room over to you. Thank you, Lorelei, and uh, really appreciate the kind introduction. Um, I'm just, I'm not sure if we're able to get the slides on the screen, but if not, I will just make my way through that. That's not a problem. Uh, maybe while that's, uh, while that's uh, coming up, um, maybe I'll just uh, I'll get started. And uh, so uh, thanks to each and every one of you for being here virtually today. Um, as Lorelai said, this is really important year for the nursing profession, not just because it's the World Health Organization uh, declaring it the year of the nurse and the midwife, but because of the COVID-19 pandemic. People around the world are recognizing the incredible work nurses and healthcare providers are doing to care for their people and communities. Next slide, if possible, please. People around the world are recognizing um, how important nurses are. Um, and uh, at AHS, we've asked nurses to take on new roles in unfamiliar environments. Whether it's working at HealthLink to provide phone advice to the public, contact tracing in the community, working in drive-through assessment centers, or supporting patients in our sites, our nurses and our staff have stepped up in every single way to protect Albertans. And Albertans are recognizing this hard work. Throughout our COVID-19 response, we have continued to receive thank you notes and donations of all kinds from every corner of the province. As a leader, reading these notes makes me feel proud to be part of this work, but it also makes me proud to be a nurse. To be honest with you, when I was invited to speak at this event, um, I thought for a long time about what I would say. Nurses can be leaders in so many ways. So, you know, you might think I would have asked nursing leaders across AHS what to talk about today. But instead, I decided to ask the nursing student who shadowed me for a fieldwork experience. A uh, poor thing had to do 300 hours with me. Um, and at the end of it, I think she had less hair than I did. She told me she was actually surprised to learn what nursing leadership looked like beyond the bedside. And she highlighted that her leadership fieldwork opened her eyes to just how many nursing leadership roles there are at AHS. So today, my goal is to give you some insight into those roles and what we look for in our nursing leaders. You'll find that many of our nursing leaders share similar qualities and backgrounds, but our journeys are rarely the same. In fact, Fadumo Robinson, who's coming up right after me, will share her journey and how it shaped her into being a well-respected nursing leader and someone that I'm proud to have part of my team. I'll start by sharing a little bit about myself and how I wound up as Alberta Health Services Vice President of People, Health Professions and Information Technology. And I'll leave plenty of time after my presentation to hear your comments and take any questions that you may have. So let me tell you a little bit about me and how I got to where I am today. So uh, some of you might be expecting me to say that I've wanted to be a nurse since I was a kid, um, but that's not true. Um, I also never envisioned that I would be in a leadership role that I am in today. And I certainly didn't envision I'd be in that role here in Canada. When I was younger, I actually dreamt of becoming a Royal Air Force pilot or a sound engineer. <clears throat> and that's where, I, that's where my love was. But after doing some volunteer work um, and uh, a mom that was a nurse, um, I decided to actually take the step and I went into nursing. I trained in the UK um, and I graduated in 1989. I lived in the hustle bustle of the city centre of Manchester. I worked in a busy generalised systems ICU before deciding to take the risk and head here to Canada. <clears throat> I went to Grand Prairie because they told me it was the foothills of the Rockies. Um, it wasn't until the night before when my uncle asked me where I was going, I told him I was going to the foothills of the Rockies and he said somewhat inquisitively, 
Grand Prairie, what do you think the guys are? When I arrived, I realized that the Manchester soccer games I attended from time to time actually had more population in the stadium than the Grand Prairie population. And I looked at myself and thought, what had I done? I came for a year and 30 years later, my first step into leadership uh, was in 1994. Um, after the very first round of regionalization. I'd been a nurse working in ED, but because I had little seniority, I was bumped under the collective agreement on three occasions following the closure of acute care beds during the Ralph Klein days. I landed on a float team, but found it wasn't for me. Not having a home or knowing where I would be working from day to day, I found it disengaging. When regionalization occurred, I didn't know what to do. And a physician colleague suggested I apply for a new regional administrative role. Unhappy with my current role, I applied um, with real, no real belief I would be successful. I hadn't been a middle manager, I hadn't been a frontline manager, and this would have been quite the, quite the step. But to my surprise, someone took a chance on me. Um, I got a position of director of ER and ICU and ambulatory care for the entire region, um, ahead of two of my previous managers who'd also applied on the position. Um, I was now leading people who had been not only my boss, but I had oversight for colleagues I'd only been working with at the bedside just days before I skipped to whole middle management level. Uh, you can leave a slide there, that'd be awesome. Uh, new to the role, I decided to go and meet with the ICU team. I sat down with them in the multipurpose room and started to talk about the new role. It was hard as there was no job descriptions, no previous experience. I had no management experience or leadership experience. And no one knew how this was going to go. Uh, one of my former colleagues asked me about budgets and what I knew about them. Um, in an attempt to be open, honest and transparent, and maybe demonstrating a little bit of vulnerability, I said, I don't know much about budgets, but I was eager to learn. Three days later, an article appeared in a local newspaper. The headlines were about this new health region. It was a buzz all over the province. And there was a quote from a nurse in ICU saying, what do you think is going to happen when the new leader openly admits he knows nothing about budgets? To say but least, uh, right then I thought about giving it all up. What had I done? Uh, why had I made this decision? Well, I'm suddenly now on, on display. But you know what? I was game to give it a go. I had nothing to lose. Um, and it, that I had to demonstrate resiliency from day one. And I'm going to talk a little bit about resiliency later on in the presentation. Have I changed my open, honest, transparent approach? Um, have I, did I hide my vulnerabilities so I could always appear that I knew everything? that I was a super nurse in some kind of way? The answer is no, definitely not. In fact, I tell you that acknowledging what we don't know and showing vulnerability is likely one of the key attributes I appreciate most in a good leader today. I also realize the importance of resiliency and let me tell you right now, it's an essential attribute. So the cut of the about me shot, I had the pleasure of having a number of progressive leadership roles since that time and in a variety of different areas as Laurel I highlighted. Uh, one of the most rewarding for me was as the Vice President of Medicine and Legal Services in the North. It was really great because who better than a nurse to lead physicians and lawyers? Nurses take on roles as leaders at all levels and all areas of the organization. We have nursing leaders at the bedside within research, education, professional practice. In fact, we have nursing leaders in information technology, in government, federal and provincial organizations, regulation, and even in supply management. There's so many opportunities for leaders in so many different places. Several of our largest hospitals within AHS are led by nurses. And there are also nurses on the executive team, such as myself. I actually have two colleagues as nurses on the exec. Regardless of where we are a leader, formal or informal, our role is to support and be accountable for high quality, safe patient care, to partner with our other healthcare professionals and be active and contributing team members. We have to provide a vision for delivery of progressive care that ensures a sustainable, efficient work environment where staff feel safe, valued and supported. We have to always be thinking critically and considering many factors and perspectives into our decision making. We need to consider the impacts of our decisions, not just at the time, but into the future. We must continue to look at the latest research and evidence and be able to translate that into practice. We need to create environments that allow nurses to work to their full scope by removing barriers and supporting innovation. But before we can do that, we need to build spaces where staff, patients, families, stakeholders feel safe to provide feedback and voice concerns. 
We also need to be conscious to instill what we know in the next generation of leaders through mentorship. And finally, it's our role to do our best to help our staff build the skills they need to shield themselves from compassion fatigue and burnout. So nursing leadership roles are very dynamic. It'd be extremely difficult to get a sense of all that just by following one of us around for a day. But I want to underscore a number of important things. At AHS, leadership roles can be informal and informal. And whether providing that leadership at the front line or in the boardroom, the foundations remain the same. We have the ability to influence. Whether the practice of our colleagues on the unit or the nurse working in government or in, who influences policy and legislation. Both are ultimately trying to do the same thing, improve the health system and the care we provide to patients and their families. At AHS, we are conscious of those roles and their equal importance. Now I'd like to move on to three things that I look for in our nursing leaders at AHS. These are things that help us stay committed to our roles as nursing leaders. Of course, there's a plethora of leadership books that will describe things way better than I will. And I can only dream of having all the content and knowledge in my head. So today I'll talk about some of the qualities I, that I think are critical for nurse leaders in today's environment. And that's regardless of whether that's a formal or informal leadership. Next slide, please. The first is resiliency. I've spoken a little bit to that already. I can tell you I've experienced the importance of resiliency many times over the last 26 years. Whether it's been new CEOs, new rounds of regionalization, fire floods or pestilence, literally right now, new boards, new governments. Um, I had to work with a site after a physician was murdered. And maybe one of the hardest things for me was the loss of great colleagues. But well, honestly, the list goes on and on again and again where resiliency was so important. In healthcare, resiliency carries us through difficult and challenging times. It's especially important now as we respond to the pandemic. Every day, our staff and leadership rise to enormous challenges. Honestly, I'd be more concerned if people weren't feeling worn down or stressed out by now. And I'm sure as students, you're rising to your own sets of challenges, whether it be at school or in your personal life virtual classes, lectures and presentations. I guess the good news is you can watch the latest edition of The Crown while I'm talking today and still look like you're paying attention. But as leaders in healthcare, our ability to manage this stress and anxiety, cope with uncertainty and recover from disappointments and setbacks has a ripple effect. It affects the morale of our staff, which impacts the experience of patients and their families and our ability to work as a team. Resiliency allows us to be there to support our staff when they need us most, so that they in turn can be there for their patients and teams. As nursing leaders, it's also our job to build resiliency in our staff so they can build the skills to cope with the many challenges they face on a routine basis. I'm incredibly fortunate to have a CEO, uh, Dr. Verna Yu. She joined AHS in 2012 as a Vice President of Quality and Chief Medical Officer. She made it her priority to ensure our organization does a better job of supporting our people and helping them build resiliency so they can provide the best possible experiences to staff, patients and families. And in her role as CEO, this still remains a top priority. Two of our organization's four foundational organizational strategies, the patient first strategy and the people strategy have been guiding this work for the past several years. Uh, Dr. Yu recently gave a presentation that touched on resiliency to, group, to a group of medical students. She shared research that showed that highly resilient care providers share many, share many of the same qualities. Um, and I uh, borrowed some of her slides and I'd like to share those with you. Next slide, please. To start, um, highly resilient health, healthcare leaders approach their work with a sense of curiosity and the wonder of a child, what's called beginner's mind. It allows them to live in the moment and approach the day's activities, whether that's a meeting or an intake or a conference with fresh eyes and open ears. Highly resilient healthcare leaders do not feel like they need to control the outcome of a situation. We're exposed to a lot of pain and suffering, but we need to know not to internalize that or feel like we're responsible for making that pain and suffering end because that leads to feelings of helplessness. Instead, we need to let go. That doesn't mean we give in or give up. It doesn't mean we don't show compassion. We do our best for patients, but realize the outcome is out of our control. Highly resilient healthcare leaders show compassion to themselves and others. They know compassion starts with yourself. When you're kind to yourself, you are more likely to be kind and compassionate to others. 
Healthcare is demanding field of work and often frontline clinicians can feel very overwhelmed by a situation or feeling. For me, when I'm feeling that way, I take the time to exercise. It's actually why I have a spin bike in my office and I'll often do meetings set on my spin bike, camera off, of course. Um, for a point in time, I used to do three classes a day. Um, I really wasn't stressed, honestly. Uh, but even now, if the day is crazy, I'll take a walking meeting or even just find 10 minutes to walk around the block and clear my head. What each of us do is different. It's different for all of us, but it's important we find our thing, whether that be sewing, stamp collecting, baking or reading, it really doesn't matter, just find the time. Highly resilient healthcare leaders practice gratitude and make the conscious decision to focus on abundance and opportunity, not disappointment and limitation. There are many blessings we can take for granted, such as education, good health, family and employment. By focusing on the good things, we attract more good things. You don't have to be happy to be grateful, but you do need to be grateful to be happy. Make it a habit. Start and end each day by thinking about three things for which you are grateful. Highly resilient healthcare leaders are true to themselves. They honor themselves by being true to their personality, their spirit and character. Authenticity frees you from the pressures of trying to be something else, including being perfect, which I know as nurses can be a bit of a problem. When people feel better about themselves, they are less likely to turn to self-destructive habits for solace. Authenticity allows you to truly connect to your work, your relationships and yourself. Highly resilient healthcare leaders make a commitment. They do what they really believe in and make a commitment to do it, even when they don't want to. And you know, there are times as a leader that we don't want to. When people commit though, they live to their fullest potential because they become bigger than their excuses. And finally, highly resilient healthcare leaders embrace faith over fear. They trust their intuition. They listen to their inner voice and then choose to trust it. They remind themselves they are resilient, resourceful and capable of facing and overcoming any situation. And these are the qualities that I see in our leaders as well as many of our staff. Next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about collaboration. Uh, working together um, at AHS, I see collaboration happening every day and everywhere. It's fundamental to everything we do and to the success of our health system as a whole. It's what helps us truly make a difference in the lives of our patients, residents, clients, families, as well as our communities. As leaders, we need to collaborate with each other, with our partners, but also support other professions to collaborate. Sometimes we experience a tendency to collaborate more with those who share similar backgrounds as us. For example, it's not unusual for the nurses to collaborate with another group of nurses. If I think about COVID um, and our response alone, I've seen hundreds of places where collaboration made the difference. One example where I was asked specifically to help was in our health link. When we first started the pandemic, HealthLink that was staffed only with registered nurses and had a daily call increase from around 3,500 to 4,000 calls per day, started to receive upward of 15,000 calls per day. We were unable to meet the call demands, wait times were in the hours, and when people called and the people in government wanted us to do more. The team that had only been used to using nurses but couldn't find more nurses, um, and after a number of discussions of analyzing the work and the roles, reluctantly agreed to look at redeploying allied health professionals and administrative support. We put allied health professionals in, we gave them some on the job training and the results were phenomenal. In a collaborative model of nurses and allied health professionals, they were able to reduce the wait times from hours to minutes and they improved the ability to handle the large volumes in a way that they never had. Additionally, in 2018, AHS introduced what they call collaborative care or COACT. And in fact, Fadumo, who will be speaking earlier, is leading that uh, work for us within the organization. It's a model of team-based care where healthcare providers collaborate more closely with each other, patients and their families within care hubs. Each member of the care hub plays a role in providing day-to-day -day direct care to a group of patients and works towards shared goals. Care hubs operate as a single unit wherever they are implemented. Patients are assigned to a care hub rather than a single healthcare provider. The types of healthcare providers who are part of a care hub may change depending on the needs of the patient and who is the most appropriate to meet those needs. But every care hub needs a leader, someone to be that check and balance, to be the mentor, to organize, to prioritize, to make sure the right people and providers are involved, 
to ensure teams are adapting to patients' healthcare needs, and also to communicate, which is a critical piece of any leadership role, because collaboration and communication go hand in hand. So who takes that lead? Yep, you guessed it, it's usually a nurse. When Collaborative Care launched in 2013, it was implemented in 161 units and 20 sites across AHS. Today, it's now active in 425 units and continues to grow, and it's in multiple settings, acute care, addictions and mental health, ambulatory care, children's health, continuing care, and many more. But as nurse leaders, we know collaboration needs to happen with those outside AHS, including our government, our regulatory colleges, community groups, post-secondary institutions, and many more. But the results can actually be the same. This is also true for the ongoing pandemic response. In fact, um, if I had to highlight the contribution of some of our partners, because responding to this pandemic has required all Albertans to come together. Next slide, please. Maybe just give you a couple of examples of where external collaboration really becomes important. An Alberta company called Sprung Structures donated a temporary structure that with the support of several other business partners was turned into a field hospital it's now located just outside the Peter Lougheed Center in Calgary, and it added 67 acute care spaces if they were needed to respond to COVID. Another Alberta company, Exergy Solutions, worked with its industry and university partners to develop and build 200 ventilators that will supplement the province's existing supply. And they were able to do that in a phenomenally quick time. They worked with clinicians and side by side. We received phenomenal support from the provinces, health foundations and trusts, which are partnering with, an, with one another in a new dynamic ways. With the Foundations of Gratitude campaign, more than 20 foundations and auxiliaries encouraged Albertans to place hearts in their windows to show support for frontline healthcare workers. First of its kind partnerships between multiple foundations led to Text for Hope. Text for Hope was a free service that provides subscribers with three months of daily positive text messages as well as the creation of biorepository to support COVID-19 research. Foundations have also funded the purchase of non-medical masks for HS frontline workers and tablet computers to provide patients and continuing care residents with the ability to virtually visit with loved ones while visitation restrictions are in effect. As we continue to respond to the pandemic, HS also continues to work with the Ministry of Health to provide further clarity to businesses, their staff, clients, and the public on how to act and operate safely. Hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea of why we look for collaboration in our nursing leaders at AHS. Our ability to work together is what allows us to continue working to improve our health system. Healthcare is always changing, not just because of things like COVID-19, but because of society's changing demographics, increasing rates of chronic disease, rising healthcare costs, and the demand for new technology and new procedures. I see these as opportunities for us to constantly improve in on what we do, but also learning, which is a great segue into my final section. Next slide, please. Continuous learning. We recognize the strength of our health system relies on many factors. Continuous learning is one of them. As students, what you are learning now is preparing for the field you are about to enter. At AHS, we work with our education partners to help students reinforce what they learn through student placements and preceptorships. I see a commitment to continuous learning within our nursing leaders across AHS too. Some of you might be happy to hear that when I say continuous learning, I don't just mean taking a course or attending a webinar. That form of continuous learning will always have its place in healthcare, but what I'm talking about is learning from our experiences. In any setback, we have to open, be open to addressing what could have been done differently and really taking a moment to ask ourselves, what did we learn from this? At AHS, we built a culture of learning and innovation, which has been serving us well during the pandemic, but it has helped us in other work. Next slide. Just to give you a bit of an example, um, we are in the process of rolling out an electronic information system called Connect Care. It'll house um, AHS, its partners and affiliates medical records and all information needed to support care wherever Connect Care is the record of care across the entire province. Patients will be able to access their health information through Connect Care as well. A member of my team, Bar Cathol, um, who's also a nurse by background, has been helping to lead this project. The skills that Barb has gained through patient care, collaboration and continuous learning have translated in her ability to co-lead a $1.4 billion project that benefits care delivery across the province. 
In late 2019, we've launched the first wave of Connect Care at a few of our sites in Edmonton, including the Walter C. McKenzie campus. Many of you might know that as the U of A. I'll take a wild guess that for many of you, a transition to any electronic system will be a breeze, but when you've been used to doing something a certain way for a very long time, it adds to the challenge. Launching Connect Care certainly came with its own set of challenges. There were many issues and frustrations, both expected and unexpected. Things like how to place a monitor in the room so the patient felt like you were speaking to them rather than the computer screen, how to adapt to new workloads, and for some simply how to use, use technology to its fullest after they've been documenting on paper charts. When we first went live, I spent some time doing nights and uh, walking the halls of the university. And I spent one night in the general systems ICU um, <clears throat> where they were doing multiple organ transplants. The system had just been implemented um, things weren't printing where they were supposed to. Uh, the teams were having challenges navigating the screens and managing the orders. I spent some time watching the staff deal with a critically ill patient who just responded to a multi-organ transplant um, and was actually crashing. They were frustrated and even angry that the system was a hindrance. Um, yet as an outsider watching this going on, I saw the informal leaders step up, remind their colleagues that this was about the patient, reassuring that if the system didn't work, do what they needed or, and didn't do what they needed to. They could do what they did yesterday, pick up the phone, call for blood, rather than use a computer or ask the doctor directly for order clarification. The nurses were learning, but it was the informal leaders that were able to create calm purpose and ultimately assure them they were all providing great care. What was the learning? It can be tough. There'll be bumps, but don't throw out the skills you've learned and used every day for your entire careers just because of a new change. This story has become a powerful reminder of the importance of continuous learning. We learn from each other. On October 24th, we successfully launched wave two of Connect Care, adding nine more sites in the Edmonton zone. How we were able to launch Connect Care while still remain focused on our COVID-19 response, our growing positivity rates was absolutely amazing. And then to add, we had a strike on day two of Go Live. Yet the learnings from wave one have translated into wave two and the issues and challenges didn't exist anywhere near as much as we thought they would. It wasn't without its problems, but it was much easier for everyone. We've got seven waves left to go. We know there'll be many more challenges lie ahead, but each wave will better prepare us for the next because our leaders and staff are not only committed to learning, but sharing those learnings too. So you can see at the organizational level how learning from our experiences can make an impact. Last slide. So I hope that I've helped open your eyes to nursing leadership roles at AHS and what we look for in our nursing leaders. Continuous learning, what helps us to improve on what we do and how we work together so we can provide the best possible care to Albertans. Collaboration, so that we are able to harness the strength of working together with people of all backgrounds to improve outcomes for Albertans. Resiliency, which is what carries us through the challenging times and still allows us to be there for people who need us most, our patients, our staff and our communities. But of course, the list isn't exhaustive. Our nursing leaders have many other incredible qualities that I recognize and I appreciate. Within my team at AHS, we have had conversations about leaders of the future. Those leaders of the future are you. So with that, there's one final hope that I have for you. As you hear from each nursing leader today, I hope that you will feel inspired to think about the leader within yourself. Feel grateful for the opportunities that lie in front of you. Thank you for your time today. I really appreciated the opportunity to speak and I'm happy to hear from you and answer any questions you might have. Thank you. John, good morning. It's Kelly from Ontario. Hi, Kelly. Good morning. Kelly, Kelly good morning. sorry to interrupt you. We're asking everyone to please mute and answer questions in the chat and I will happily facilitate the questions to Sean. Okay, I'll just write it out right now. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. So please, just as a friendly reminder to everyone, we're kindly asking everyone to please stay muted and please keep your cameras off for the event. And if you have any questions for Sean, I am I have the chat open and I am happy to facilitate that conversation with Sean. So Sean, thank you so much for a really inspiring um, opening keynote. This is a great kickoff to uh, the conference here today. Um, there's a few questions that have been pouring in, so without uh, further ado, I might get into it if that's okay with you. Perfect. Uh, so the first question is about how you use your bedside experience in your leadership role today. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. 
Um, and let me start by telling a story. Um, so when regionalization first occurred, and I, I talked a little bit about this earlier on, we had no, no job descriptions. It was a completely new role. Even people who'd been in leadership roles before didn't know what they were going to do. And I can tell you, I sure didn't know what I was going to do each day. And so I sat in my office um, and after a, a couple of weeks thought, what's this job all about? And so what I decided to do was put on my uniform and I went out to every site in the region and I actually worked alongside uh, frontline staff. I worked days and nights, worked along with the docs um, in the eMERGE department. And uh, what, my bed, what I was able to do is take my bedside experience to create those relationships, uh, create those partnerships um, and develop a, a rapport um, and uh, uh, some credibility um, actually with the people that I was working with. And while I didn't do that because I thought it was the right thing to do, I actually did it because I didn't know what to do. Um, mm -hmm. It actually turned to be, out to be one of the greatest learnings that I had uh, through my career and, and taking the time to spend time with people and understand what their work is. And um, so what was it? Uh, critical thinking um, that regardless of where we're at, um, this is about our patients. doesn't matter whether I'm a leader, or whether I'm a frontline nurse, this is all about the care that we provide to our patients, our communities, the system as a whole. And uh, one of the things that really struck me is that as a frontline nurse at the bedside, um, I was all about and being committed to patient-centered care. And so when I say patient-centered care, and this is probably something many of you have heard, um, it's about asking patients not what's the matter with them, but what matters to them. And that one phrase um, actually can work in so many different places. I now have the people portfolio as part of my portfolio. And so it's about asking our staff, what matters to you, not what's the matter with you. As I go out and I meet with external agencies, it's still a mantra that I keep in mind. Um, it's not about what I think should be important. Um, it's about what's important to them. And lastly, I think uh, the skills that you learn from a communication and compassion perspective are absolutely critical um, to any of our work. Um, and uh, every day I'm able to bring the frontline bedside skills that I of communication and compassion into my day to day work as a leader. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. Next question is from Marilee. And her question is, how do you encourage emerging leaders to balance their authenticity within the boundaries of institutional expectations. So sometimes authenticity can lead to disruption of institutional norms is what she says. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, Laurel, are you only supposed to ask me the easy ones? Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing. Um, and so, um, you know, I don't know that I have a great answer for it. All I would say is that um, when I look at some of my colleagues, when I look at my leader, uh, Dr. Yu, um, she doesn't worry about authenticity. She comes as herself, she demonstrates herself, and um, she sees importance in doing that. Um, and um, sometimes it's okay to challenge the norms. Um, and quite honestly, if that organization isn't willing to accept uh, my authenticity, if I talk about personally, then maybe it's not the right organization for me. And that's easy to say, much harder to do. But I, 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 what I would say is just embrace it. Uh, just be who you are. Um, bring your whole self to the work. And uh, if you're getting pushed back, then you need to find a way to be able to help change. And I think as nursing leaders, we're well positioned to help change the culture and support the culture. It won't happen overnight. It won't happen, um, won't happen in days. It'll take years in some cases. But honestly, uh, just be who you are, bring your whole self, be authentic as a leader. Um, and I think it can go far. I think people are starting to respect that and understand that. Thanks, Sean. This question sort of leads on from your response there. There's a question from Kelly who wanted to ask a question earlier. She said, you touched on vulnerability. How do we encourage nurses to show this in an environment that's historically a place of the super nurse that should know all? Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, and I have to tell you, you know, day one, uh, talking my teams as I described um, in my presentation, um, I showed vulnerability. I actually didn't realize at the time that I was showing vulnerability and demonstrating vulnerability. 
um, and it came back to bite me um, in spades. Um, and it actually made me question uh, whether I wanted to be a leader. Um, and sometimes I think we just need to push through um, that. I, I think it's okay. Uh, I don't think, I know it's okay uh, to show vulnerability. I know it's okay to show emotion um, and to be, um, to be our true selves. Um, you know, there are days where I remember when I was training, uh, don't shed 